I am Ira Kirschenbaum. Uh, besides being the chairman of orthopedics at Bronx Care Health System, I am also the editor of the Journal of Orthopedic Experience and Innovation. Um, I am uh, pleased to say that tonight's um, tonight's uh, the Journal Club is being sponsored by Heron Therapeutics, the makers of Zen Relief, um, which is uh, a product that uh, speaks to opioid sparing. Um, if you don't know it, you go to uh, Zen Relief, Z Y N R E L E F dot um, but we're going to hear more about that later. Um, I am very excited to have back for a, a journal club. Uh, I think the first one was 18 months ago already. It was a while ago. Um, Dr. Andrew Wickline. Andrew Wickline is, uh, without question, the number one by volume joint replacement surgeon in New York State. Um, no offense to other states, but that, that's not Wyoming. This is New York. And there are uh, a lot of competitors in New York City, um, but I will tell you that uh, Andrew has distinguished himself as um, appropriately opinionated about how joint replacement and the episode of care should be done. Um, has traveled, we talked about this a little earlier, to 42 places to see how other surgeons have done their work, which I think is, uh, that alone is a lesson to anyone who's listening. You know, you, you get better when you watch others and you visit others and you listen to others. And we'll talk to with Andrew about that now. Um, Andrew published uh, three uh, amazing articles in the journal, um, combined readership about 4,000 views, um, which is, um, you know, the average view in the average view in a journal of author class is about 63 per article. And so to get 4,000 views in, in three articles is, is really absolutely remarkable. Um, and tonight we're going to talk a, a bit about uh, Andrew's article on, that he wrote on opioid free. But in general, we're going to talk about what Andrew's doing now. Uh, where he's going with opioid-free protocols, where he's going with his protocols, and where he thinks that uh, knee replacement um, decisions and knee replacement decision-making is going. Um, so, Andrew, you want to just sort of give us a little introduction about how you got to this world of uh, being, um, I'm going to embarrass you, the guru that you uh, um, have become on this stuff. Thank you, Ira. I, uh... I want to first say um, that I'm, I was the co-author, my uh, author uh, for this, this article. Uh, I don't know if she's going to get on Kaylee uh, Corrado. I did send the invite out to her, but she's interviewing for um, orthopedic uh, spot. So anyone needs an outstanding uh, uh, applicant, uh, Kaylee Corrado, my co-author on this article. Um, she's done hip fractures with me as a third year student. Just came on. She just came on. Wait a second. There she is. There she is, amazing. Amazing, right, right oh. after the accolades. <laughs> uh, I won't, I won't tell her all the nice things I said about her. I, you know, I don't want her to get her head too, too swollen. But uh, Kaylee really is the one that did the the work on the study. She called uh, and reviewed every single patient. We had 386 patients with our our uh, original protocol, which uh, showed that 86 percent of uh, total knees need 10 opioid pills or less through uh, 90 days post-op. Just by way of comparison, Journal of Orthoplasty just published uh, Bernanski's group that the state of Florida uh, has done a good job. They reduced their opioid use overall uh, from 174 uh, oxycodone to 104 oxycodone in 90 days. Uh, that's just published uh, last month. So, so again, we're still 10 times lower than that. And the majority of my patients use tramadol, not oxycodone. Uh, so I asked, uh, I tasked Kaylee in between all the different things that she was uh, doing as a third year student, you know, I want you to, I stop all of my patients and then, uh, every single patient who had another, uh, um, prescription filled, I want you to find out why. And, uh, cause I, I read this stuff that said somewhere between eight and 14% of uh, total knees, uh, be, were becoming addicted. You know, I'm, I'm at risk. You know, Scott has an amazing story. If you have a minute to touch base with Scott about this where, you know, it really touched his life as well. You know, um, I'm worried that I'm making eight to 14% of my patients addicted. I'm doing 800 uh, joints a year. That's a huge number of people that I'm on the hook for. 
And so, you know, I said, I don't really think that's the answer. So we really looked and, and sure enough, there were a lot of patients that used opioids more than I thought, uh, 73 patients. So like 20% of patients ended up getting another prescription outside of the 90 days. Right. But when you look at it, it's almost all due to back pain. And so you start thinking about it as, you know, maybe, you know, the total knee, even though the total knee is miserable, I think everyone believes that spine surgery is worse. So I think that, that, you know, if you have back pain and knee pain, you're going to go and see the, the knee surgeon first and kind of push off that spine uh, uh, pain issue. And so I think the knee might be the, the, the bell with the harbinger. I saw that cat. <laughs> um, <laughs> might be the harbinger of really uh, more pain to come, right? All of these patients who have knee uh, osteoarthritis, they were gifted or, or cursed with the genetics of 50,000 mile cartilage. And, you know, so their other joints, their fingers, you all have seen the Heberdeen and Bouchard nose, uh, their, their hips, their spine, uh, those, they're all wearing out at the same time. And so that's what we really found. We found, at least using our protocol, that we only had one patient that, uh, you know, ended up using six prescriptions in a calendar year, which, that, you know, we kind of made up a, th there is no definition of chronic opioid use. Right. Um, so we figured more than six prescriptions, that's over half the year. So in my mind, that's, that's pretty chronic. Um, although we did have one other person who had five prescriptions. Um, but that's really what it, what it, uh, that, that's the real gist of the study. Um, the, uh, you know, I, I think when we look at these big database studies, looking at opioid usage, it would be helpful if those studies, uh, suggested, uh, why, uh, those patients are using opioids. You and, mean the claims data studies? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it makes it look like it's the total knee because they had a total knee that year. But again, that's why this article, I think, is so uh, important that it really may not be a total knee and we may not be the, the scapegoats that would be made to, uh, to look like. Well, it's interesting. So I'm going to show a, a, a slide that, that I had at a uh, um, meeting recently. Um, I call it the, uh, uh, can, you, can you see that? The, the pain points of pain, right? Um, how many of these things, Andrew, have gotten in the way of, of joint replacement for you? You know, patients deciding surgery. Um, the difficulty with physical therapy was probably the, my call to action. I live in a small town and, and patients would come to me and, uh, you know, six weeks, they'd still be kind of unhappy. And by three months, they're, you know, oh, I like my knee now. I said, okay, well, the other knee's terrible. You're still walking poorly. What, you know, you, you know, tell me, do you want to get this other side fixed and get your life back? And they said, absolutely not. I absolutely hate therapy. I'm never going uh, to, to have this knee done. And sure enough, as you know, as many of the other surgeons on this call know, ultimately they, they give in because they can't take it anymore. But it's that, it's that three days a week, 90 minute torture session, you know, uh, uh, of therapy. That's, that's the, and, and, and the knee swells. You know, look at your ACL patients. You know, when we first started sending ACLs home, Scott can tell you, you know, the, the day of surgery that night, they're pretty comfortable. When you go to send them home the next day, that knee is big and swollen. And if you don't hurry up and get them out that morning back in the day, uh, they would stay for two days because suddenly the, the knee would swell. It's like a compartment syndrome on the knee. Extraordinarily painful. I yeah. have my own knee scope. Uh, I've had three of them. And the second time I walked too much, the next day I could not walk. I took 100 cc's of blood out of my knee. My knee was better. And, and that was another uh, uh, point that it said, okay, I get why patients are having pain now. It's, it's, it's great. And, oh, and I'm just curious, how about ED and readmissions? Because people are going to ask you about that. You know, are you seeing ED visits for pain? Or I'm, I'm sure you're not. I mean, I, I just didn't see that in the article. I have a 1.2% 90-day recidivism rate, all comers. Wow. Wow, 1.2. We, we have about... We're, we're in a community where the ER is essentially an extension of people's living room. Um, but I will say that uh, we have about a 10% at 30 days. And 70% of those are for swelling, pain and swelling. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so, you know, Joe Bosco's group, they published uh, their uh, BPCIA data, and it's 5.7% and for hip and 5.3% for knee or vice versa. 90 day recidivism rate. and you know and, and and they might be in a little different demographic than you are to be fair you know and so yeah. it's still a pretty high number 
Yeah, and also, yeah, they're a tertiary care center, and uh, sometimes they may go to an emergency room they don't know, you know, their own place. But um, let me ask you a question. I mean, I posted something on LinkedIn about just a pre-op x-ray of a terrible knee and said, how in the world would an insurance company demand physical therapy? And then all the physical therapists went crazy on me. Um, on, you know, how can you say pre-op physical therapy is an indicator people could be cured? How did you make that jump? Because it almost seems also like you expose yourself to liability as well. You know, if they have a manipulation under anesthesia, they'll say, oh, you didn't do physical therapy. You know, so what you're doing something. So what exactly are you doing to compensate for not doing physical therapy? So first of all, if you have a worn out knee, you know, if you have a, you know, I race cars, if any of the online don't know, I, I'm in my garage. So I race cars. If you have a bad ball joint, does uh, driving it an extra four weeks uh, make the bad ball joint better? No. So, I mean, first of all, the, the, the entire premise doesn't make sense to me. Admittedly, uh, an arthritic joint does see turnover of the, uh, uh, of the arthritic joint fluid with gentle exercise. But if you exercise too much, there's clear data that shows increased nociceptors uh, upregulation of pain receptors in the knee to tell you to get off the knee. And so doing that before surgery, I think expands the uh, post-op knee uh, because I think whatever your baseline number is, then you do the trauma of surgery. I think those nociceptors uh, are logarithmically increase. So if you start with 10 with no exercise or you do exercise and you start at a hundred and you now you're logarithmic, you know, in terms of the post-op inflammation, you're going to have an unhappy patient. So that's right. number one. Number two, uh, in terms of the therapy part, um, I do have my, uh, the national uh, manipulation rate is 4.0%, uh, 4.9, uh, somewhere in there. Uh, I'm at 2.2%. I'm in a very aggressive uh, with manipulation. I manipulate at 31 days. Uh, you know, Medicare and, you know, these other people, you know, anything under 30 days, that's in, your, in that window. You know, I think that's it's kind of bold. But we all know those patients who come in, if, they, if you're at 95 degrees at four weeks, you know, the, the ship has already passed. You know, you're, you need to manipulate that patient. Waiting six, eight, 12 weeks, and then saying I'm gonna manipulate after 12 weeks of therapy and $1,400 of co-pays for that patient and someone driving them uh, to therapy. You know, that, um, that doesn't make any sense to me. You have to recognize that that patient's behind and get them back on track. So I'm, even with that 2.2%, you know, that, that's because I'm an aggressive manipulator. Right, so what are, what are some of the very specific tools uh, or products or things you use to get those kind of results, essentially opioid free total knees, um, half the manipulation rate nationally, okay? Um, half or much lower, much lower than half of ED emissions, you're in a, you're, you're not in a, a, a bougie community. You're in a working class community, right? So, yeah, so we, we're, it's 64% Medicare. In, in, uh, I'm number 11 in the nation for lowest 90-day cost, episode of care costs, the Medicare claims database. Uh, but in the top 20 surgeons, I have the sickest patients. So these are not, these are not cherry-picked patients. Uh, these are patients that, like you said, are working class, you know, non, uh, you know, bourgeois <laughs> Uh, that's, that's not us for sure. Um, right. And so what it is, it's, it's education. Uh, and it really, uh, you know, you and, and uh, Craig with the swift path kind of got me on that, you know, patients want to know, am I normal? You know, we all forget as surgeons what it's like to be in that chair. You know, I, I unfortunately got to sit in that chair with my wife through uh, multiple different cancer uh, treatments. And it's scary. You don't know what to expect because you haven't been there before. And so when, when you think about what the patient's going through, and you, and, and you hear the same stuff day in and day out. In fact, I know many of the surgeons on, on this call have heard patients say the same thing. My, my knee feels like there's a big vice around it. Uh, it's numb on the outside. I hear a click. All those things, if you put it down in writing before right. they ask the question, it is now an explanation. If, you, if, if the patient asks a question, why does it hurt on the inside of my knee? And you explain that's where the medial arthrotomy is, and blah, 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 and the saphenous nerves. It's no longer an explanation. It's an excuse. Right. Right. And so it's, it's all about managing expectations. It's no different than, than, than owning a restaurant. You know, you have to you have to set the scene. You have to manage expectations. So, you know, I had both of my knees done. 
Um, and I always said that, you know, it's obviously, obviously one of the advantages I had was being a very educated patient, you know, about what to expect. And I only had, uh, I, I was in a similar program that you were in with Craig McAllister. And uh, I had only three opioid pills for each knee. Um, and the main reason was I had a little bit of peripheral edema. So um, talk to me first of all about, about your, your pre-operative education protocol. I mean, people talk about education, they throw, they throw a book with the patients or they send them to the hospital joint camp. Yeah, so that, it has to be every, you and your entire team from the hospital, the ASC, your office, they all have to be on the exact same page. They have to know exactly. So I have meetings with my team in my office. They, every time we, we upgrade the book, we talk about it. I have videos that are, are the same. So every patient hears the same thing. Um, but, but here's an example of education. I tell my patients there's three, three times that you might need, well, it's probably four times. But in general, three times you might need a pain pill. Number one, 36 hours. All the surgeons on this call know that between 36 and 48 hours, the knee itself hits its peak swelling, very, very painful. The periarticular block we put inside the knee starts to wear off. Okay? I tell them there's going to be a second pain spike. Second pain spike is around 72 hours. I used to say day five because uh, Dave's on here. So David had this amazing pain ball for me. When it works, it gives five days. It was amazing. Uh, but, you know, the logistics sometimes for some of my personal population was were challenging. So it's either, again, whenever that, that longer acting medicine, whatever you're doing in your practice, you tell the patient it's going to wear off. So that might be another pain spike. And then, and I'll show you guys in a minute, uh, you want to you tell the patient on day six or seven or eight, somewhere in there, <sighs> that you've all received that phone call. Oh my God, my calf's killing me. Suddenly my knees, my legs really sore. I can't put any weight on it. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, something's wrong. No, you tell them ahead of time. You're going to get three pain spikes, 36 hours, 72 hours, day seven. What do you do in those pain spikes? As soon as you see it coming, you stop exercising. You ice and elevate, toes above the nose. You, um, uh, you then, if no better in 20 minutes, you take a gabapentin. I use gabapentin. I know there's a meta-analysis that says it doesn't work. That's BS. I can tell you, I can show you the number of refills for gabapentin that I do. Uh, and then 30 minutes later, if it's still no better, you take a tramadol. And lo and behold, uh, the, most patients, since they know it's, that's what it is, they're not scared anymore. So right. many times they don't need the, that narcotic. And so the same thing happens for those three other episodes. So day seven is when the leg hits its maximum swelling. Uh, can I share? Let me, let me share this. Yeah, screen. sure. It's just, you should be able to quite easily. Hold on a second here. Uh, I'm clicking it. Are you seeing it? Yeah. Highlights yeah. from publication. Okay, hold on a second. We don't need that anymore. Let's go here. Let's go. This, uh, I, okay. So. Let me just show you the study first, and then we'll come back to these other steps. So I'm minimizing the faces. Here we go. So this is an amazing study uh, by Brian Lloyd uh, out of uh, Colorado. He's a doctor of physical therapy. I want you to look down at the bottom. Can you see my arrow moving? Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. If you can't see it, I'm over at the far left. It says 10th, 25th, 50th, 75th, 90th percentile. Do you see that? Yeah. Yes. Okay, perfect. So that's day, like, you know, that's like day, that's 12 hours post-op where that, that's mark is, okay? And then if you come uh, out to where this other box is, that's kind of day six. If you go all the way to the top, that's kind of the peak swelling somewhere in there, day six, seven, and eight. And you can see that that leg, this is looking at swelling in the leg post-operatively. You can see that that leg is 46% more swollen than the baseline at day six and in, in the 90th percentile. If you're down here at the 10th percentile, you can see that it's 18% uh, of uh, uh, baseline swelling. So which curve would you rather be on? Do you wanna be on that, that, that the 90th percentile? So that means everything you do between day zero and day six, how much walking you do in particular, is going to increase your swelling. And then that's the point from which you actually recover from is day six. And if you look at the inset, the inset is actually two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, six weeks, seven weeks post-op. And you can see even at the 10th percentile, seven weeks post-op, there's still 11% more swollen than baseline. Right. Oh. Right. So what does that tell us? That tells us that, that, you know, this is a huge inflammatory response, but yet what are we doing? We're telling patients to go to therapy three days a week, do a 90 minute workout and then walk, walk, walk. So let me show you a different slide here. See if I can go back up now. 
So here is this. I'm going to discuss this at the OSET meeting that's coming up. Uh, here are some of my keys. Week one, this is 750 steps per day. All right, this is minimal, right? Uh, even at week six, this is the number that we're seeing, 4,500. You start going over that number, patients start having increased pain, maybe needing a refill gabapentin, maybe having a little trouble sleeping, feeling tight again. So if, if, if anything, I want the, the audience to, to this is where I'm heading. I'm doing multiple studies. We're doing 3D volumetric scanning. We're doing a, a 256 channel bioimpedance. We're doing single lead bioimpedance and then regular tape measuring uh, of uh, legs. We're doing this for hips and knees because I wanna create a, a more robust swelling curve. And then I wanna find out what things uh, can get every single patient down to that 10% level, All right? So, I mean, and this makes sense. Look over here on the right. If you sprain your ankle badly, do you walk extra to make it heal faster? No. And if you have a tibial plateau fracture, you know, do we let those patients wait bare and, and uh, uh, at six weeks? No, sometimes we wait even 12 weeks. And is that patient normal even then? So I think the swelling is one of the biggest keys to uh, post-op morbidity, pain, readmission, uh, uncertainty, and of course, arthrofibrosis and manipulation. So let me see if I can stop sharing my screen now. Yeah. Is there any questions on that? Maybe some, maybe some of the other people in the audience that, that uh, uh, might have some questions for me, because I really think that in the next uh, three to five years, I'm, I and others like me are going to have some, some potentially uh, game-changing uh, ideas on this. Well, if you if anyone wants to ask questions, you could ask through the chat, or you could un um, mute yourself and just ask. Um, I'm going to tell you: Are there some technologies out there that are attacking this pain that you're looking at, or is it just raising a leg, compression, ice? You know. So I think there are a number of ways that we can combat swelling. You know the. Um, uh, the guys from uh, uh, First Kind Medical Gecko, I'm part of their registry. Uh, you know, that's a um, muscle stimulator that looks like an iPhone watch. It sticks on the calf uh, and it makes the, uh, the foot twitch uh, 60 times a minute. So it acts like a sump pump for the leg. Uh, I think that uh, makes uh, a lot of sense to me. It's FDA approved for a DVT prophylaxis, but uh, I'm really, you know, when you, when you don't do any therapy, use no tourniquet, you have patients walk five steps every hour, you have to do 10 ankle pumps every hour, your DBT rate in, ends up being next to zero. Uh, so, you know, again, I, I think I, I'm interested in that product more from a standpoint of uh, swelling reduction. Um, you know, there's the SEDs, uh, of course, there's the, the graded compression stockings. I can tell you, you know, at 51, standing 20 years, I get one plus pitting edema. And so I put those stockings on, they're impossible to put on. And, you know, my fingers aren't gnarled with our osteoarthritis. So I think that's a, that's a tough one for patients to deal with. I think uh, some of those devices out there like the, the game ready, I, I like it. You know, I think it, it's, it's got great, the science behind it, but the price tag is painful. Right. Um, so, you know, uh, and then I think there are some ways. So one of the studies that we're looking at is we're, we're using a um, uh, bactericidal wash that has a matrix metalloproteinase inhibition. And that uh, has significant anti-inflammatory effects. I think that may help. Uh, we're using uh, branched-chain amino acids for, uh, to prevent muscle loss post-operatively. Those branched-chain amino acids also, uh, interestingly, reduce CRP, IL-6, IL-8 uh, faster than baseline. So I think that also helps with uh, swelling. So I think there's a multifactorial uh, way to go about this. Lastly, bioflavonoids, which are a supplement in the US, uh, but in, in Europe are uh, uh, well-documented for lymphedema control, uh, I think may make a big difference. That's yeah, so pretty, pretty, pretty amazing that you've, you've focused on, on the swelling. Um, because there's but, no money in it, Ira. That's why no one focuses on it. Right. You know, every surgeon gets $1,266 for the Medicare total knee and then says, go see the therapist because I can't afford to, to see and listen to you complain. I'll see you at six weeks because I have to. Um, but, but I really want to wait until it's you know, 12 weeks in a day when I can at least uh, you know, charge you know, $67 for a follow-up visit. There's so, so much of focus on the first three or four days, but your graph really shows the money is happening at six Days. Well, that's where you hit the peak swelling. So the right. focus is in the first week. That's why it's 750 steps or less per day. And you must tell that 57 year old male, the worst patient out there, that uh, they, you know, 
they think they know best. Then that doesn't hurt. Yeah, I know it doesn't hurt to walk that much. But what they're doing is making the knee swell. Fluid does not compress. And so they're only going to get 90, 95 degrees max because the knee is so swollen that it will not. You cannot compress that fluid. Right. That walks in there, turns a the scar, and then it's too late. Hey, hey Andrew, it's uh, Scott Sigman. I'll forgive you for not mentioning laser on this, this yes. occasion, but I'm sure you'll talk about it next time. But it, for very specifics, can you give us the particulars about what exact modalities you're using? For example, are you using Ayurveda? Are you doing uh, regional blocks? Is it anesthesia doing it? Are you doing local infiltration, spinals, et cetera? Give us, the, give us like your, your, your 48 hour protocol that's happening as far as pain management. Uh, post-op and then, you know, four or five days prior. So uh, these studies are without Ayavera. Uh, these studies are with uh, the um, adductor uh, canal catheter with the pain ball and a paraarticular block and no tourniquet with mechanical axis and a, uh, a PS knee. So uh, the currently uh, I think, uh, and I can show you that, I'll show you all of the, the let, me, let me share the screen again. All cement, I assume, as well. All cemented, yes. Uh, let's see if I got um, the things that I think uh, make a difference. Um, so again, no tourniquet. I think that's a, a huge difference. Nineteen percent reduction DVT. And I know there's studies saying it doesn't make a difference. You know, I challenge any orthopedic surgeon to wear a tourniquet for an hour in in the meeting, and then let's watch him walk two days later. Try to use TXA on an aspirin on almost every patient. I think that makes a difference for the post-op swelling. Um, I, I, there are some, there's some interesting studies out of uh, China that are published in the Journal of Orthoplasty on a couple of different protocols uh, with TXA, more than just the two doses we typically use. And that significantly reduced swelling, at least on a measured outcome. So we're working towards that. Uh, as we get our baseline data, we'll uh, hopefully have more information on that in the next uh, year or so. Um, so what I do for those patients, they are, currently they're getting an adductor canal block with the liposomal pivocaine and a pararticular injection. I'm using kinematic alignment now, so I don't strip that medial collateral ligament. I think that's ex extraordinarily important to uh, reduce pain and reduce swelling and provide a stable knee that the patient feels confident on. Um, I am using also medial pivot design. I uh, Doug Dennis's paper and Doug is not a, uh, he's a PS user, uh, but his own paper says that medial pivot provides the most uh, normal uh, native knee uh, range of motion. I think, I think that's what patients are looking for. So that feels normal that they can trust. Uh, and so you're not getting that muscle co-contracture that you frequently get with a PS knee because it, it's just not stable enough. Um, I don't use a drain, probably shouldn't use staples. Uh, you wanna try to minimize the intra-op and post-op opioids. I don't do any strengthening until six weeks post-op. I focus only on range of motion. And I have patients do um, six, uh, um, seat, you sit down in a chair, you, you lock your foot on the floor, uh, you bend it back as far as you can, lock your foot on the floor, scoot your butt forward, make your knee bend. Then you put your foot up on a, on a little ottoman and uh, you do a heel hang and you push flat. You do 10 of those, each of those once an hour. And I'm looking for 90% uh, of uh, daytime uh, awake hours, uh, 90% 90, 90 of the hours, you know, with a box checked. Right. Um, I do 10 ankle pumps and I tell them to walk five or 10 steps per hour to prevent blood clot. I do not want five to 10 minutes, but five to 10 steps. Um, and then toes above the nose, ice and elevation for 40 minutes out of the hour that first week. No different than an ankle fracture. We all know that the ankle fractures cannot tolerate that leg being hung below the heart. Uh, and then you have to manage their, their post-op anxiety with, you know, am I normal on track? So every single day post-op, I have data about exactly what the patient's going to feel. And uh, I mean, it's, it's accurate within about four hours. Um, and then, you know, you do have to have your office staff kind of discouraging opioid refills. We'll do it, but, but we want to know why. And then I think the surgeon has to be the captain of the ship. You got to be personally responsible. Uh, so again, in the, in the ASC or in the hospital, doesn't matter. They go home the same day, either way. Uh, it's added canal block uh, with liposomal pivocaine. It's a periarticular block using uh, no morphine, but uh, using uh, uh, neuropin, toradol, uh, clonidine, and saline. Um, and again, like we said, we're doing a, we're doing a study looking at whether or not some of these other bactericidal washes may reduce inflammation. For your ice, are you using a machine or just having a bag ice? 
So actually, my ice and this study and currently is just using those uh, those, those sleeves that um, have reusable frozen packs that, that that kind of fit in like a, a um, just like a TP over the knee. Uh, yeah. They are not amazing. Uh, so I am working with several different companies trying to develop what I think would be a, a better option. Andrew, just curious again, Scott, for your tourniquetless uh, total knee replacements. Uh, how long is, what's your time? You don't have to give me the seconds, but how about in min minutes uh, for your components in? Uh, start to finish for females, 52 minutes. Uh, start to finish uh, for males, 56 to 58 minutes. Um, the, uh, the knee is flexed at around 30 to 32 minutes. It's washed um, uh, with a, um, just a standard, you know, jet lavage with a little bit of epinephrine in it. When the knee is flexed, you really get very little bleeding and I get a nice white bone interface uh, to, to put cement in. So, so I don't think you need to elevate the tourniquet for that. Um, and there's been multiple studies to show that since. Um, and then you're looking for mean arterial pressure of about 65, uh, unless that patient uh, you know, has some other um, condition that the anesthesiologist is unhappy about. Personally, I do not like um, spinals. Uh, I used to love spinal, but uh, the spinal creates significant uh, relaxation of the, the peripheral vasculature. And so you actually get more bleeding with the spinal, even though the pressure is low, you actually get more bleeding. Uh, so my preference is to have uh, general anesthesia uh, with a mean arterial pressure of 65. I'm gonna um, take a two minute um, break here and um, give homage to our sponsor. <laughs> For a second, I feel like this is the uh, a Milton Berle in the 1950s. Um, I'm going to share the screen because actually I'm going to play this this little video, but then I'm going to ask you a question about anti-inflammatory medications intraarticularly. Okay, so we'll, we'll we'll do that. And hold on a second. Let me just here we go. Um, to your screen. Okay, I'm gonna play this. You have to hear my voice again. Hi, I'm Dr. Ira Kirschenbaum, the editor of the Journal of Orthopedic Experience and Innovation. Today's Journal Club program is made possible through advertising sponsorship from Heron Therapeutics, the makers of Zim Relief, and by the involvement of participants like you. The current slide shows some information about the use of Zin Relief, Lupinacaine, and Meloxicam. Please take a moment to review this information about Zin Relief, which will be followed by a scrolling version of the important safety information for your review. The full prescribing information for Zin Relief is available at www.zinrelief.com forward slash prescribing hyphen information dot pdf. You can connect to Heron Therapeutics through their website at www.zinrelief.com. Feels like I just watched uh, a YouTube. Uh, hi, I'm Dr. Yeah, Arthur. hi, sorry. The editor of the Journal of Orthopedic I, I guess Experience. It's, it's looping. Music. Okay, there we go. Yeah, it took me forever to do the music, you know, myself, you know, uh, all the instruments and everything. Yeah. So, um, so let me ask you a question. Even uh, irrespective of that, the fact that uh, Zimbabwe, for example, is meloxicam, you know, there's an anti inflammatory component. 
Uh, someone uh, texted me a question about maybe using st some steroids and they were always afraid of infection with that, you know, you know, but some people use steroids in intra-articularly. What do you think about pharmacologic anti-inflammatories uh, in the joint? You know? So uh, I, I will say, actually, I've used that Zen Relief product. Um, when you have someone that you can't see, you know, the adductor canal well, a large, large patient, or they just got aberrant anatomy. Yeah. Um, so there have been some cases where we've used that for the knees, and I am using it for the hips. Uh, it's it's easy to administer, and um, uh, we've had some pretty good success with it so far. I, I am interested in whether or not there's there's decreased swelling. So that may be at the next on the uh, on the three D optical scanner um, uh, test. But um, the you know. I, Prednisone works. I, I use it from the majority of my patients. It has, some, you know, orally, uh, and of course, have some modest risk, you know, that I think they're putting inside the knee. But I will tell you that, uh, um, uh, you know, Ranawad and others who've used it, they, they, they stand by it. I definitely think the Toradol inside the ejection makes a difference. So why, yeah. would, why wouldn't, uh, you know, uh, injectable steroid locally? So I, I've just been a little chicken. I've been pretty successful. So, you know, I do. And sometimes you add one more thing and that's when the whole house of cards comes down, you know? Yeah. I, I see a couple of uh, young joint surgeons on the call. What would be your advice to get started with this protocol? You know, you're doing, let's say 50 a year, 75 a year, but you really, really want to get started. You know, you're not going to, you're not going to put in this whole thing all at once, or maybe you will, you know what I mean? Um, What's, what's some, what are some first steps to get these kind of results? The first thing is you've got to, you have to own your own business. Uh, and your business is taking care of the patients and giving outstanding customer service. And with that, that means you have to uh, educate the patient. And I, I tell you, the, the thing that, that, that Craig and you uh, uh, both you know, brought home to me was, you can't let the hospital write a book about this. That that doesn't that, you know it's for ten different surgeons doing ten different techniques. The patient, well, you know, it doesn't mean anything to them. And then you have to make your staff and the patient read the book. You don't read the book, I'll cancel your surgery. I, I don't need to do your twelve hundred sixty six dollars surgery and have a complication to make and give myself a black eye and you a, a, a terrible problem for the rest of your life. And so once you start doing that, uh, I mean it, that you know TXA anterior hip. Uh, you know, I do a lot of computer navigation, KA now I think is another big thing I'm doing. All of those pale in comparison to the education piece. I think I don't know, at least 40%, maybe even 60% of your outcomes is patient expectation, meeting expectations by, by explaining what's going to happen. And when you do that, you look like a wizard. You know, when you predict what's going to happen on day, you know, 36 hours and 72 hours and day seven, uh, and you don't get that panic phone call anymore. It's interesting. I, I see that Kaylee's on the on the call. Kaylee, do you like to want to comment on any part of the study? Kaylee Corrado, I'll put you right on the spot. Hi, I will say I think the expectations was definitely something that I saw Dr. McGlenn do very well in handling expectations. And patients would come in and they would say over and over, they're like, yeah, it's amazing. Right when you said it would hurt, it did. And so I think, like you said, taking that fear away from it was the major issue. And that's something I haven't seen really addressed anywhere else. And I think that's a big, um, a big component of why the outcomes are so good. Yeah, it's interesting. I, it's, it's a great point. I, I, I one time wrote that um, pain is like a dog barking behind a door. You hear the bark and you don't know the size of the door, but if you know the size of the dog, you don't know the size of the dog, you know whether you could be afraid or not. You know, if you kind of know if Dr. Wickline and yourself have told you that dog is a small beagle, um, it's may put a have a big bark on, the, but it's not going to go. You know, pain won't go past six, and if you follow the protocol, you may bring the pain, keep it down to four, taking away the fear. If they think it's a German Shepherd, they're taking opioids. Correct. You know, they they really are. Um, 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 let me, let me ask, someone sent through a question. Any, any thoughts about the, the 
talking me the the you know the, the digital implant from uh, Canary, you know, making a, a difference on um, giving the doctor information. Uh, what what are your thoughts about that technology? So, so uh, um, I, I have a number of thoughts on that. For, I, I think it's it's ideal uh, for uh, a surgeon that really wants to you know, spend and understand what's going on with the patients. Right. The, the benefit is that it's, it's, it's on, it's on all the time. You know, I've done a limited, I'm doing a limited market release with one of the companies on one of their, um, their uh, digital range of motion devices. And, you know, the, the patients, they're not happy about it. It's, it's cumbersome. And, you know, you, you constantly have to recalibrate, they fall off. Right. There's, there's this whole idea that technology is going to magically make ta- knee replacement better. No. You have to own it as a surgeon, period. Um, you know, like, like I we, when we said at the very beginning, when my surgeon colleague from a young surgeon from LA came out, he couldn't believe it. And one day he saw what I'm talking about. And, and that's, that's what you can have for the rest of your practice. You can have happy knee replacements, sometimes even two weeks. If you have 125 degrees of bend at two weeks uh, uh, post-op, then you, don't, you can hang up on this call. You don't need me. You don't need anything I have to say because you, you're already killing it. But if, if you're not getting that at two weeks, uh, then, then I'm happy to, to host you. Come on out. Uh, we just had a surgeon from Italy. Uh, we're going to go uh, over to Italy and Switzerland, uh, hopefully later this year, to, to do some education on this. It's, it's really makes knee replacement fun. I mean, it's kind of like when you first started doing anterior hips, and it was so much better than direct lateral. The patients were so much happier. Right. Uh, and, and, and now I, I, I honestly think my my total knees are happier than my anterior hips at two weeks. It's, wow. it's pretty crazy. I mean, how many how how surgeons can say that? Not many. It's how much will you slow down your therapy for swelling? If you see a knee that's starting to swell quite a bit, how, how much, how aggressive will you slow down the therapy? So I, I, you cannot stop the bending and the straightening. That has to happen. And you have to do five steps an hour because you're going to get a blood clot or pneumonia, period. That has to happen. That's, I, I, in my mind, that's, it's, if you don't do that, you're going to end up with arthrofibrosis uh, and an unhappy knee, or you're going to end up with PE, uh, DVT, and unhappy patient family or, you know, uh, having calling hours to go to. So those have to happen. It's all about the number of steps. I mean, if you wear a Fitbit and, and I want you to look and see what time in the morning you hit 750 steps. I mean, it's literally the minute you walk into your, your office, you've hit 700 steps. Wow. And, you know, and, and, and that's what I'm saying for the whole day. But it makes sense, right? We do yeah. not. Nobody who sprained their ankle badly is doing 4,500 steps the next day. But that's what we're telling our patients to do. Go to therapy. It's literally a 90-minute workout. Go visit one of your patients who go to therapy uh, and watch them cry and scream uh, after doing, you know, doing things that make the knee swell. So I think if you, uh, if you move to Italy, I think more people will come and visit you. Uh, yes. In Geneseo, New York. I, yes. There's nothing wrong with Geneseo. I think it's fine. Yes. You know, it's the, yeah. It's the Italian Alps, actually. So yeah, he's got, he's got a gate lab. I'm really looking forward to going. Uh, I think that's the next thing. I really think that the, you know, by not disturbing the ligaments, by by really recreating the natural joint line uh, and then providing right. an implant that's that's really essentially ACL uh, competent, where you only have two millimeters of anterior post excursion, you're giving a knee that, that functions better right out of the gate. You're not getting the co-contraction like we talked about. You're not getting pes anserinus. You're not getting distal tibial band. You're not getting anterior compartment pain. 87.5% of, of unhappy knees have anterior knee pain. Right. You know, it's interesting. I, so uh, recently, as you know, I, I got out of the operating room and people ask me, what do you miss? Do you miss the OR? I said, I, I don't miss post-op. Post-op patients, yes. The OR is fine. And I miss the OR. Now, if you can do the OR without post-op, <laughs> it's great. But post-op is like, is, is like cleaning up your kitchen after you yeah. after the Thanksgiving meal. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's not fun. It's not fun. But now you've made post-op fun. When you have a patient come in in two weeks and no cane, full motion, minimal swelling, and you have to hold them back, that's yeah. fun. Yeah. Okay? That's, that is fun. So, again, I, anyone else on the call, please, I, I do not have all the answers. So I, I, sometimes I come across that way, so I apologize. That's why I visit everyone else. 
I'm from West Virginia. I've always been told I'm second best. I want people to challenge me. So anyone else have questions about what I'm doing or, or does anyone else have something I could do better? Talk to me about, are you using Ayurveda now? I am. I personally had it three times myself. I have a grade four defect in metaphermal condyle. Uh, and when it starts hurting, it's really miserable. I, I didn't really recognize that, that just constant throb, how, how, you know, it really distracts you. It's distracting. Uh, so I've had it three times myself. Um, I give it to myself now, actually, it's kind of fun. Uh, the, uh, uh, what I tell patients with Ayavera, patients who are at the point where they need a new replacement, right? Where they've got, you know, grade four change, medial compartment, patellofemoral space, osteophytes all over, that patient's probably not gonna benefit from Ayavera. So I write in my book, I say, listen, in my experience, patients who are ready for knee replacement, only 60% are gonna see some pre-op improvement prior to your surgery. But you know, there's a study out there showing it at all time points that measured through 12 weeks post-op that those patients who received Ayavera uh, had uh, lower pain scores. Uh, you know, Vinod Dasa, you know, he's constantly on LinkedIn showing his patients at two weeks, you know, a, a large patient, BMI 39, no narcotics, full motion, and, and walking around pretty happy. And, and I'm telling you that it's part of it. My patients who've had with and without, hands down, they want diabetes if they had a third knee. Fascinating. Fascinating. And when do you do it? Can you do it two weeks before if you wanted to? So, so unfortunately, Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, pretty much nationwide, has decided not to cover it after they did cover it, even though it's FDA approved. And I think this is illegal because they're making decisions uh, that they shouldn't be. Um, they're not the, the, the prescriber taking care of the patient, but in any event, we let them get away with that in this country. Uh, so, so now those patients have to pay. So they, I have cash pay for that in my office. Medicare covers it and their, their secondary insurance does not cover it. The hospital does okay on those Medicare cases. Um, and your PA will do okay making that, that reimbursement doing it. And you can do it with the anatomic technique it takes about 40 minutes for my PA uh, if you're really good at it, you can do it in about 28 minutes. So you can get two done per hour. Um, and I, I recommend doing it somewhere between two to three weeks preoperatively. So the bruising kind of goes away. Uh, right. The um, uh, uh, Medicare rules, you have to do it a minimum of 10 days before the total knee or it won't get covered. So it has to be a minimum of 10 days if they're going to do it through insurance. If it's cash pay, my patients coming in from California or from Canada or Houston, then they'll come in on like a Thursday. I'll see them. I'll make, I get my new x-rays. I want my own x-rays in my office. So that's all included as part of that cash pay thing. I do the Ayavera that's included. We do a day before they have surgery the next day and, and then uh, stay over one night and then fly home. Uh, so what kind of things, uh, if anyone has a question, just, just in turn, what, what is on the, we don't have a lot of time left, but what is on the horizon for you now? Uh, that you want to solve right now? Because it sounds like you solved quite a bit. What are you doing? I know you're, you're looking at the swelling and, and, and what, 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 any, any other stuff that we left out that may be on the horizon that you're studying, that, that you're looking at, that, that you want to change? You know, I think, uh, you know, Laura's involved with a company that's, that's got a product that's down, coming down the pike that, that may, may yield you know, zero pain or, or, you know, significantly lower pain over 30 right. days. You know, there's another product that's coming down the pike that may, that you can put intraarticularly that, that may yield a 14 day uh, pain relief. The problem is going to be is that surgeons who aren't paying attention in what happens to that patient in the next 30 days, you know, those patients are all going to get that special, you know, pain blocker. Pain is a protective mechanism, right? Yeah. So if, if you start walking on a bed of coals, you know, it hurts, you jump off, right? You don't just keep walking and, and burn through your foot, right? Pain yeah. is a protective mechanism. And so what's going to happen is you're going to have surgeons who aren't really thinking about this and thinking, oh, this is going to be great. I'm going to use this new catheter that Lars Group has or this, this new thing inside the knee. And, and that patient's going to walk all over creation. They're going to get a big swollen knee. They're going to have a, a, a higher than average manipulation rate. And everyone's going to blame the drug or the, the, the device uh, that was used to create that pain-free state. They're gonna right. say, it has to be something with that. That's what happened. No, it's because the patient walked too much because they had no pain. So irrespective, sorry, someone has a question? Yeah, with your KA, do you have limits on your varus valgus on your tibia? And then what about your rotation? Are you finding yourself 
more neutral on your femoral rotation or will you, will you ever internally rotate? So in general, it's pretty neutral on the uh, on the posterior condyles unless there's uh, obvious wear. There are cases where there's obvious wear. You have to account for that. I, you know, I don't think we know exactly, right? There are, you know, Scott, uh, Steve Howell says that the lateral, you know, femoral condyle is never hypoplastic. I, I, in that case, I disagree with him. Uh, but the question is, how much do you need to put back, right? That, it, it, it's always been hypoplastic uh, in that shape. So what is the right amount to put back to, to um yield a knee that's going to be a happy knee. You know, uh, I think the data is becoming more and more clear in multiple joints, ankle, uh, knee, that the, you know, this, this, this coronal, it, it's, it's all about the sagittal uh, balance, right? And, and where's that implant in space? You know, the cylinder of rotation is, is not down the, the, the midpoint of the femur. It's posterior to that by about a third or more. Uh, and so you have to get that, that cylinder rotation accurately placed. Uh, in addition, you have to make sure that the thickness that you're replacing in the anterior compartment uh, has been, uh, been thought about at least. And, and, and that's where I think you're going to lead to uh, a happier knee because you're, you're really balancing and getting that, the, the pulley mechanism or the extensor mechanism accurate. And no one's talking about that. The, the anterior compartment, no one even talks about. But it's, it's, I think it's the, the forgotten compartment that we all need to be addressing. So I think that's in the future as well. Interesting. Well, I have to say uh, it's, it's incredibly impressive what you've put together, um, focusing on the swelling. So irrespective, I mean, I, I know we're talking, you know, gate science is coming out with a new catheter, a variety of companies are doing a, a variety of things and they're going to get rid of, uh, assuming a lot of these catheters and stuff get rid of pain for 30 days, you're still going to be an evangelist about the, the steps and the swelling because that's the ball game. So, you know, I think a lesson to young surgeons and surgeons who are training and you know, you know, is to don't leave your basic principles behind. You know, you, you know, you may have a new implant that uh, gives you better range of motion. You know, uh, don't forget about swelling. Don't forget about pain management. Don't forget about the phone call. Don't forget about the education. You know, um, don't throw don't throw the hospital book at the page. You know, my, my book is sixty eight pages long now. I mean, it's wow. it's literally every question that patients ask. Um, you know, uh, I've, I've developed an app that uh, hopefully we'll have out by uh, Hip and Knee Society uh, that will right size the information. But now there's so much information that. You hand that to a 57 year old male that's still trying to work before the one week before surgery. Now he, that's when he's finally going to decide to read this book. And it's too late to do aya vera. It's too yeah. late to change his diet. Diet is another key factor in this. And so what I need uh, is, an, is an app. That's where technology I think is helpful. Hey, I want you to watch this video. Men generally don't read uh, as much as women do. Men will watch videos a little more commonly uh, that we've seen at least in our research. And, right. that, and so if they get that video, hey, watch this eight minute video you know, while you're, you know, you're standing in line, uh, you know, uh, waiting for parts at the store that, and it's the right time. Hey, here's how you can make a difference for your surgery. And you're, you're five weeks out. I want you to do X, Y, and Z, uh, at four weeks out. Hey, this is your last chance to decide if you want Aya Vera and check with your insurance, see if it's covered or not and get it scheduled. Uh, and you know, so make a phone call today and it, 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 you make the 68 page booklet now in, in bite sized packets, right? Uh, it's very digestible and it's right timed and right sized. Yeah. I mean, we found um, that sending people texts with links that they click at the right time is also a good trigger, you know, rather than having them sign on. We, we don't have a community that people log in and download yeah, yeah. apps. We have a text no based email. community. No emails. Uh, most of your patients are, are retired. They don't read emails. So it has to be text. So I send my six week uh, video out to my patients uh, night before reminding them the appointment and click this to watch a video from Dr. Wickline. So I'm going to watch that. They come in. It's amazing. I, I, that's why it's a great visit. They come in. They have no questions. They say, Dr. Wickline, that video was so spot on. Oh my God. I thought this was going to, this was bad. This was bad. I'm actually doing better than I thought it was. And it becomes like, it, you know, here's some cookies, here's some cake. And that's why I'm fat, you know? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, well, we get empanadas in the Bronx. So it's, it's, yes, uh, yes, yes. Same thing. So I'm going to uh, close it out unless someone has some last questions. I'll, I'll open it up. Um, I want to say thank you to Kaylee and um, 
Again, if there are any program directors on here, we have a great uh, applicant, as you said. As you, as yes, you but, but she's coming to work for me when she's done. Yeah. Okay. So I just need her to get her training, but she's mine. Mine. Hands off. <laughs> I, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll tell the program directors as a caveat on that one. Yes. yes. Um, um, I want to thank you, uh, Andrew, for, um, the, the, for tonight, of course. And for the three major articles that, uh, you know, in some sense catapulted Joey uh, more than anything. And uh, it, was, it was fortuitous timing for us both. You know, I sent this stuff to JOA, you know, 386 you know, consecutive patients, and they told me it was BS research. Meanwhile, they published stuff with uh, 80 patients, 46 patients with, this, with less data than we had. And, and so, you know, that, that just tells you that the academic centers, you know, they, they don't want to do this. There's, yeah. you know, they're scared of this information. You know, this is all ISOP database verified. There's nothing made up here. These are real numbers. 10 pills or less is a very achievable number. I think we're much lower than that now because the education has improved. So right. I want to say thank you for Joey for getting us on there. I hope to have a couple more studies. We're, gonna, we're looking at uh, pre-op and post-op uh, step counts. We're looking at pre-op and post-op uh, blood pressures. Um, and we're looking at... Uh, uh, perioperative nutrition, and of course, the uh, multiple swelling studies we're working on. So looking forward to getting some more uh, work uh, reviewed by your viewers. And if, if they think it's uh, you know, uh, worthwhile, then uh, getting it published. Awesome. All right. If unless there's no more questions, I'm, I'm going to uh, end it now. So thank you. Thank you, Andrew. And thank you, everybody else. Awickline23 at gmail.com. If you guys want to come visit, you know, I'm happy to have people come in and, and verify for themselves. Uh, I would love to have someone critique me. So uh, if you're another surgeon, please come out, uh, spend time with me, you know, uh, uh, challenge me, uh, make me explain why I'm doing something because that's where I learn. So I really thank all of you for spending a Sunday night uh, with me or excuse me, a, a Thursday night with me. <laughs>